Hello, Gems. It's time for another Saturday night hidden hour. We're so glad all of you are here tonight. Uh, Dr. John, uh, my husband, it's so good to see you as well. We've been like ships in the night or I've just been an ongoing ship in the night preparing for a big trip to Boise, Idaho. I leave tomorrow. Why am I going to Boise, Idaho? Uh, we plan to have me camped out there for the next six, eight, 10 weeks, actually, to follow in detail the Chad Daybell trial. It's a trial or, or a case you and I have been following since 2019, reporting on with our podcast since early 2020, um, before the unfathomable happened and uh, two children's bodies were found in Chad Daybell's yard, JJ and Tylee. There's a reason that John and I are interested in the in uh, sort of tackling and trying to understand the Jody Hildebrandt and Ruby Frankie case, which is why we are going to discuss this again tonight and why we have uh, now nearing 40 videos uh, about this case in our Ruby Frankie uh, Jody Hildebrandt playlist. Because as many have pointed out, these two cases are eerily similar and uh, happened in a very similar area. Chad Daybell is from Springville. Ruby Frankie is from Springville. Uh, Chad Daybell and Lori uh, Ballow met in the St. George area at a conference with people with like-minded beliefs and uh, right by uh, Jody Hildebrand's house in Ivins, Utah. They uh, had some similar worldviews, uh, in particular that children can be evil. Uh, it's not, that's not a your average belief you hear about. So, uh, I, I, we, you know, last night I actually stayed up all night last night because I'm preparing to go and, uh, posted some really important things. And one of them is uh, what I have pinned here. I'll, I'll post it again he here, the link to this crash course. I just posted it right there, but it's also in the description of this video for those that are not caught up with the Chad Daybell case, but would like to follow along for the next 10 weeks and learn more about this case head over and listen to our crash course. John and I, again, have been covering this case for four and a half years, but I feel like I did a good job. It was hard, but I did a good job uh, putting together uh, a summary or a condensed version of every episode in every interview we have done in the past four years into one condensed hour. Uh, so definitely check that out. And for those of you that listen to our podcast, that will be shared on our podcast, Spotify, Apple, et cetera, um, on Monday morning. It is scheduled. So uh, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. You'll get all the notifications as I cover the trial. And we will be live streaming the trial here at Hidden True Crime. And then I will be going live at lunch in, in the evening with my thoughts as I sit in court. So I do now officially have a ticket to sit in court on Monday during jury selection. So that's what is going on in the Matthias household and what we're preparing for. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Piola. Thank you. It means a lot. All right. But back to today's topic. Uh, I couldn't leave without us covering this one more time. Uh, John, what is on tonight's agenda? We already have um, about 1,700 people in chat. I'll go slow chat down. And why don't you share with us uh, what we're going to talk about today when it comes to uh, YouTube mom influencer, Ruby Frankie, her uh, guru therapist, Jody Hildebrand, and um, their now convictions of child abuse. Before we get into that, I just want to give you a shout out for all the work you've been doing. And it's, it's incredible. I can't believe one person... <laughs> can do as much work as you. So thank you for um, being such a wonderful spouse and for all your hard work and for covering this trial and um, for the flexibility to make all this work. So, um, you know, it's, it's obviously going to be a little bit of a challenge for our family with you gone, but we'll figure out a way to get you back and forth or meet a visit. So, um, so thank, thank you, you for everything you do and for this channel and for in my life. And um, I'm just grateful. And I know you didn't sleep last night, so this is hard. <laughs> <laughs> this is, 
this is hard for you to be here today. I know you're exhausted. You were an hour ago, yes. you were, you were trying to take a nap and you know, it, it didn't I work. I knew you were going to do the show, but it, it was, it was going to be hard. So I, I think we'll try to be somewhat more succinct or, you know, we'll be more conscious of time tonight because you're so exhausted. So. Thank you. That, that means a lot. Thank you, babe. I'm going to miss you. And, uh, but you and I both agree. There was even a moment where I thought, oh, I don't necessarily need to go to this trial. It will be televised. But John and I both agree that if we don't see this through, um, to justice all the way to the end, we will have regrets that we started our podcast when it came to, um, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. And we have become very close to numerous uh, surviving victims in this case. And I want to be there for justice and to let all of you know uh, who have supported our channel for so many years now, what is going on. So thank you. It means a lot. So as far as tonight, there, there was some, some evidence from the document dump we did not get to cover last week. And because this case is, is, different from Daybell in the sense that fortunately there were no fatalities that I get to consider the victims in a little more depth. And, um, we, of course we talked about the victims and what a terrible loss it was with Daybell, but some of the evidence that came out actually showed the victim impact and the, the injuries to the victims and visible, visible and, and, and not visible. And so, so I think tonight I want to, we might, things might be a little more somber and we might have some trigger warnings here tonight, but I want to, I want to devote a little more attention to victim impact and pay tribute to the victims here who, as I said, are, are thankfully still alive. It, it, it was possible it wasn't going to turn out that way. Um, and of course, we we always pay tribute to victims that are deceased as well, that the tragedies that occur in these cases is universally, universally horrendous. And But tonight, I think I, I have an opportunity with some of this evidence to really look at one of the victims in particular and to think about the impact of what happened and to dig a little bit deeper into why this situation is so horrendous and why the parole board should take this seriously when they're thinking about sentencing. Um, I, I, I think they might, I hope they do. But as we talked about the last few weeks, this, this, this potential disparity in sentencing between Jody and Ruby, I think that really needs to be considered or reconsidered in some sense. So, so we're going to cover a couple of similar themes, but, I want to I want to really focus a little bit more on the victims tonight and one victim in particular since we're not going to show we're not going to show ours injuries but I want to look at that and I want to talk about some of the research around that and I want to talk about the long-term or lasting repercussions of what these young children are going to go through and why that's so difficult and why a case like this sh- you know, I think that part of the reason this case has generated so much attention is because Ruby was famous and well known. But some of it is that the injuries and the victimization was so horrible that it really got people's attention. Yes. Thank you. So, where do you want to start then? Do we start with Jody really quickly? Yeah. Why don't we start? So, one, one, one thing we didn't cover last week was the the moment when police knock on Jody's door and she opens it. I th- I think it's a it's a really interesting moment. So if we could just play some of that. Okay, I'll get. I'll... Is this the one, John, where she answers the door? 
Okay. I assume so. I can't hear you, but I will play it. Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, yes, this is it. Just play it from the start, roughly the first four minutes and 15 seconds. Okay. So uh, there will be no noise in just a second. This this part is muted, but uh, just yeah. so you know, I've been here again as we're traveling here. This is um, a, it's a town called Ivan's, Utah. As you can see, it is desert landscape among beautiful red rock. And this soup, this particular subdivision is called Cayenta, and it's a very high end uh, area. And uh, all of the houses have to be one story about this house and it is, they have to be one story to blend in with the landscape and i have been inside jody's home and the views are breathtaking no matter what people say about uh, how she decorated yeah it was kind of bland but the house itself in the landscape is, is beautiful and this front door is wild by the way it is massive and clearly the person that lived here i thought to myself when they opened the door thought they were royalty so I'll never forget this door. I hope there is volume. Would we have volume at this point? Or Yeah, no, the volume's on. Oh, you can hear it. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I can't hear it on my end. I'll go fix it. Police officers, open up! Got movement right here. Right there. Contact. Got movement. Open the door. Jody, I need you to step uh, out. I have, I have by a turn. That's great. Step out of the house. No, I'm not going to step out of the house. Step out of the house. Step out of the house. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're just going to stand behind. Wait a minute. How do you come to my house? Right there. They're going into my house. So have a seat right there. Do you have a search warrant? Have a seat right there. Do you have a search warrant? Have a seat right there. I'll explain everything after. Hold have there. a seat right there. Do you have a search warrant, sir? Control 12 x Can you hold the air? We're searching the house. I can tell you what's in the house. Okay. Just have a seat right there for me. Do you have a search warrant? We'll explain it after this. You can't just come into my house without a search warrant. We'll explain everything after this, ma'am. You okay. did. Well, that's one of the reasons why we're here. So we'll explain after everything's done, after we clear the house and make sure everything's fine. But why are you coming into my house without a we'll search warrant? We'll explain it after this. But that doesn't make sense. You come into my house and do what you want, and then you tell me you don't have a no, warrant? No, we'll explain why we did. But don't you have to have a warrant? Not at this moment, we don't. We're here on exigent circumstances, and I'll explain it after this, after my sergeant and the officer are done clearing the house. Is there anybody else in the house? Yes. Two kids? There's a little girl. Just one? She's right over here. Okay. How old is she? She'll be 10 next week. Okay. And she's on this side? Mm -hmm. I have Airbnb guests over there. Probably scared me to death. Okay. Okay, stop it. Unmute. Oh, am I? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. Wow. Uh, some people are saying that was wild. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Yeah, this this is a really fascinating four minutes of video for a lot of reasons. Number one, I think it's it's really interesting to see how Jody behaves when she doesn't have the power. So what you see here is largely an attempt to grab power on both ends. She, so, you know, there's a lot of interesting elements to this, but the, the police come in like a SWAT team. You know, they don't know what they're going to find. And they're prepared for, I don't know what they're prepared for, but they seem to be prepared for a possible altercation. So it's interesting the way they approach the door. When they get to the door, there seems to be some movement before she opens the door. My guess is that's because she's calling her lawyer. And then right. she says that. So she's not really surprised that they're, I, it, it appears like she knows they're coming. I think, so it doesn't seem like she's that surprised that the police are coming, but it, she does seem by, surprised by the fact that they're going to enter her home. Right. And so you have this, you have this back and forth about who's got power here. She's on the phone with her lawyer. You can't come in. She says, she says, quote, no, I'm not going to step out of the house. So she's, she's actively being defiant to a police officer, which by the way is potentially that's another charge. But so you see, right. You have someone who, who thinks they're a prophet potentially engaged in this power struggle with the police. And you can so you really, I think you get a good sense of, the dynamic with that anybody might have with Jody, especially when you try to challenge her. So we've talked a lot about how Jody is very aggressive at times and, and angry. And I, I think you see, you see that playing out here that with the police, obviously as the officer explains to her and she doesn't quite know yet, the exigent circumstances is the translation of that is this is an emergency. A child escaped with severe injuries. They can enter this home. They don't need a search warrant. They just need reasonable cause or probable cause, which they have. She doesn't know that, obviously, at this well, point. Well, somebody mentioned that. Like, why wouldn't they tell her? But I disagree. I think she realizes R is gone because she says only E is in the house. True. And that was kind of a moment of like, you know, why would she need to be told? I think. Some, you know, someone mentioned in comments, why not tell her? I'm like, it's a solid point, but she's got to know. Like she has to know. And I think that was the point they were kind of looking at her like, well, we can come in the house because we know exactly what's going on here. You know what I mean? Like there was this moment of silence. Yeah. I don't know. I think she did know, but that well, was, that was a weird moment to me. I think that's, I think that's the most fascinating part about this, this video here is she knows, but she doesn't understand. Right. That that's what's um, what's remarkable about this moment is she knows the police are coming. She knows that R has escaped. But she she doesn't comprehend the fact that she's done anything wrong. In other words, what's happened is she's normalized this behavior to such a large degree that she doesn't understand why they're coming in her house. Right. The rules don't apply to her and she's gotten away with this other times. You know, Jody, um, we, we have heard from uh, Jody's nibbling Jesse, who who says the very thing happened to to them years ago. So, right. Right. So you, there's this total disconnect between what's occurring in that house and what she thinks is occurring in that house that she doesn't she really doesn't think that there's any harm being done. And she thinks. Really, not think. No, I, I, I don't. I, I think that she, and, and we'll, we'll see this with Ruby in a minute. But I, I think she thinks the fact that she's, she's getting into this power struggle with police, and she's telling them, "No, you, you, you know, I'm not going to step out. You can't come in here. You don't have a search warrant. All of that. The search warrants are not applicable when there's an emergency." And she doesn't, she, most people know that the police can, if there's a life and death situation, the police can enter your home for any reason. But she legitimately thinks she's trying to exert power here and say, I'm on the phone with my lawyer. Obviously the lawyer is a, a ploy to get them out too, but I'm on the phone with my lawyer. You need a search warrant. The lawyer's saying that what the lawyer's apparently not telling her is 
this is not a search warrant situation. Somehow the either the the, the lawyer or probably more likely Jody doesn't understand that in an emergency situation, they can come into the house. And so I really think um I really think there's this disconnect between what she believes and what's occurring in that home. You know, in her mind's eye, in in her mind, I guess, she knows that there's a child. She points out the other room. She knows there's a child in the other room. And she just thinks, oh, I locked a child in a closet. What's the big deal? I didn't hurt that child, right? Like she doesn't, she doesn't see any harm being done. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, by the way. Is there harm being done to the child locked in that room for hours? That's what we're going to, that's our discussion tonight. But, but the point is she, she normalizes it. I mean, the, also the other, the other moment, the other moment that just absolutely floored me was to, when I learned that there's Airbnb guests that, you know, she says, she says, I think you probably scared them to death, right? This, this, this disparity between, think about this, right? You have on one side of the house, I'm just picturing, I could be wrong. I'm just, this is my imagination here, but on one side of the house, you have a family visiting from, I don't know, somewhere in the Midwest. I used to live in the Midwest. You know, we didn't get to experience Red Rocks that often. And when we did, it was pretty remarkable. So like I'm picturing a family couple, maybe a child, a couple kids on one side of the house. And then on the other side of the house, a couple of children are being tortured. I know. Think about that. It, it actually reminded me of, you You didn't have a chance to watch this movie yet, but for those who, there was a Academy Award nominated movie called The Zone of Interest this past year. And it's about a family, a German family, and the head of the family, I don't remember his name now, but he's basically in charge of running the concentration camp, which, so you have this beautiful home and this family living this normal life. And then you have, they have a common wall. And on one side of the wall is the family living their normal life. And on the other side of the wall is a concentration camp with all these, all these right. victims and, and, and that are being essentially led to the slaughter. And so you have, you have this, you have this complete disconnect between this guy who's in charge of this concentration camp, whose job basically is to eliminate human beings, to kill human beings, raising a family as if it's completely normal. And he, all he has to do, he, so he rides a horse into work. So he, he rides across the threshold into the concentration camp where you hear screaming and gunshots. It's all in the background. You know, part of the power of this movie is they don't show the actual crimes and horrors being committed in the concentration camp, but you, you know, it's there and you see the smokestack with the crematoriums and all the people that are being, you know, herded into the crematoriums. You see, you constantly see, and it reminded me of that in the sense that you have on one half of the house, you've got these kids being tortured on the other half, you have this family that's there like having vacation and having a blast and, um, you know, on a, on a lighter note, and I, I know we get some pushback for levity a little bit in these circumstances, but um, on a lighter note, I had a I, my first thought when I, I I kind of laughed when I first heard her say that because I thought my my initial reaction was this is like family vacation with Chevy Chase meets like the Deer Hunter or Rescue Dawn or something, right? Like I don't know. The Deer Hunter is an older movie, and it is one powerful movie, by the way, for those of you who haven't seen it. But it was like, again, like this absurdity between, right, this family and this these children being tortured in the same house with a common wall, right? It's it's, and and I've seen what I think would be the Airbnb apartment, and it is very nice and would fit a family. And there's a big screen TV and a wet bar and just a place for just a picture perfect vacation, a door to probably being able to use Jody's pool. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, talk about disassociation too. I mean, I guess just to be able to, I don't, I don't know what you would need to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to just throw some guests there. <laughs> Ain't no problem. I'm going to, Right. I'm going to, I'm going to go from torturing children and I'm going to walk, you know, 10 yards over to this family and greet them and, you know, wish make them sure a wonderful, their are clean. Yeah. Right, make sure, give them some clean towels, wish them a wonderful vacation, you know, in inter- play, you know, make sure they have their, yeah, make sure they have their pebble ice machine working and, uh, <laughs> Right. It's like, it's like National Lampoon's family vacation meets like the deer hunter. It's crazy. It's, it, it's, it's such a wild disparity. But I think that speaks to this issue I'm talking about, which is I really don't think she understands what she's doing here. I mean, at some level she does, but she's normalized it to such a large degree that she doesn't see why the police would come to her house when one child has escaped with horrific injuries and the other child is sitting in a dark closet, locked in a dark closet, forcibly locked in a dark closet for hours on end. Mm-hmm. In other words, no. complete isolation. She does. She apparently thinks that that's just normal behavior. Or could it be like Lori Vallow where even at Lori's sentencing, she's like, nobody was murdered here. My children were murdered and they miss me and they tell me I'm a great mother. And this just happened because you guys don't understand. And and it's all of her big belief system. There's a part of me that wonders that she's so entrenched in her belief system and the pen papers, uh, the visions of the pen papers that, that she just simply thinks she's absolutely protected and nobody understands why she's doing what she's doing, that the kids are evil. And as Ruby says in a recorded phone call from prison, you know, adults can't understand that children are evil. So nobody's going to understand this. Like, could she just also be misunderstood? Well, on that issue, let's go to, let's go to the Ruby Frankie police interview. Okay. That's the second thing I want to look at. So also just quickly on that video with Jody, We've talked about this before. There is an element of fear there too. If you notice, if you look carefully, her hand is actually shaking. She's holding the phone and she's shaking. I mean, some of that, some of that could be just that she's holding the phone and she's tired and maybe it's unsteady. But I do, I do think with Jody, there is, you often see this underlying fear, this fear that gets masked by anger this fear that gets masked by defiance, right? But, but there's still this underlying fear. So that's, I think that's, that's another interesting part of that video. And the Ruby uh, police interview is, it is that same. I think it's I just been, see it. Yeah. It's in the same, it's in the, the long, long crime. crime, roughly at nine minutes. And I see it. You okay. timed it well. Um, okay. I'd like to think by the way, we're using videos. Um, they are, you know, public videos, but law and crime and KSL, which is a news um, organization in Salt Lake city. We are using them as sources today. So we'd like to thank them and the links to their uh, channels. And these videos are in the description of this video. Um, so here we go. Don't worry. I know it's not this. I'm going to switch it over now. and slowly walks out of the closet. EF is later taken to a hospital. Hildebrand and Frankie were ultimately arrested. When officers later questioned Ruby Frankie, she doesn't say a word, seemingly unfazed. Is this your water? I'm gonna... It's yours if you want it. We'll save that a couple of hours. We also have snacks if you need anything to eat. So I know I introduced myself to you earlier, but my name is Detective Bates, and this is Sergeant Tobler. We're just here to talk to you about kind of a few things involving your kids. So first, are you, do you live down here or? Or do you live up north? Do you want to talk to me about where you live or how many kids you have?
So we just spoke with your husband, and he said you guys have six kids. Okay. Well, there's all together. Are those all your kids? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. You good? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Okay. I, I like that comment totally. about Morse code blinking. That's <laughs> yeah, right. She's... I like this too from Free Spirit Christina. It's just smug, entitled, you know. Right. So so imagine we just watched a little bit of that with Ruby Frankie. So she says she literally says nothing during the entire police interview. We just watched the first minute and it's painful. But there's a sim the reason I want to show that is because there's a similarity with with Jody's opening the door, which is I think they're both they're both asking that question, why am I here? Or you know, with Ru Ruby's trying to figure out why am I here? What have I done? Right? And I think Jody is asking the same question. What have I done? Neither of them understands the magnitude. of their behaviors on the victims. They really don't. I think there's, I think the commonality there is there's a total disconnect. You know, Ruby, you could argue that maybe Ruby's not talking because her lawyer's not there, or maybe she was told to stay quiet, but it is really hard when a, when somebody is talking to you in a normal social interaction and you just give them the blank stare and you don't say a word, it is very difficult to do that. And I, I think there really is this smugness. There's this arrogance. Yeah, arrogance. This Just arrogance like about why am I being detained? Why are you even talking to me? My children are fine. And so I, I you know, when, when I look at those two side by side, I see a lot of similarities. Jody, I think, is at least internally, she's saying the same thing. You guys have the wrong person. I don't know why you want to come in my house. I can tell you what's in my house. There's nothing to see in my house. And I think Ruby has the same attitude and the same belief. And so the, 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 the question I would ask for both of them, given these videos, is how do they or how do, maybe how does someone in general get to the point where – torturing children becomes normal and acceptable behavior. They don't even seem phased by it. They don't even seem to understand why they're being questioned or why they're being asked to leave their house, right? It's, it's amazing. I have a question about this one. Can we share the difference? Um, I just lost it. Um, no. Yeah. So Julie makes a solid point with Ruby's interview. She has the right to remain silent as much as I detest her. I don't disagree with her approach here. I could say a similar thing, but what is it beyond the silence? So is it the smugness, the arrogance? Because it's one thing to be silent and it's another to act how she's acting. So can you maybe even pinpoint it a little bit more for us? Since you're the site, we got a psychologist in the room and we're live with you. What is it? Is, is it that the smugness, the arrogance, the lack of expression? Yeah, I, I think it's the just the there's the, like Jody, there's I think there's some defiance there in, in the sense that yes, it's it's possible that her attorney or an attorney could have contacted her and said, Don't say a word. But but I mean if you if you we're not going to look at it but if you look at Jody's interview she talks she doesn't say much but she speaks ruby doesn't even speak you know it's 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 one thing to engage in kind of polite banter with police right that would be more acceptable like just to say look i i can't talk to you that's what jody says i can't talk to you because my attorney doesn't want me talking but Ruby can't even do that. And so, right, that, that's where the, the smugness and the arrogance come in. Or somebody just said contempt. I agree. There's contempt and there's defiance. And, you know, again, I go back to this issue of what did I do wrong? I didn't do anything wrong. 
Jody, you know, Jody answering that door. What are you guys coming in here for? There's nothing to see here except the fact that there's a victim. There's a nine-year-old at the time, nine-year-old. There's a nine-year-old victim who's been in my closet in the dark for the last 10 hours or 12 hours who hasn't eaten anything, hasn't had water, but hey, nothing to see here. And then on the other side of the home, <laughs> there's a, a family doing, you know, um, you know, diving into her pool, doing, you know, belly flops in her pool. So I, I think there's some similarities there. I think it's true. I mean, it could just be that an attorney told her don't talk. But even then, it's it's so extreme in the sense that she can talk. She she can She can interact with police. She doesn't have to say anything substantive. But it would be normal for her to interact some to say, even to say that. That's what Jody does. I can't talk to you. As much as I'd like to talk to you, just be polite. Right. She can't she can't even do that. Right. Yeah. A smugness. I think you're right. Some contempt. And right, a mission from God, like Lori Vallow, exactly, Priola. Thank you everyone for your kindness today and for donating the memberships and for your support tonight. It's not going unnoticed. Thanks, everyone. So in this, this will take us back to last week a little bit, but that that question about how does one get to the point where torturing children becomes normal behavior, you know, it, it that's going to tie in with last week a little bit in the sense that if you believe that children, as you said earlier, if you believe that children are demonic or possessed, you've already begun that process. You've already dehumanized them. Correct. So, so in that sense, if your goal is to try to perform some type of exorcism and get the demons out and your perception is that torture is the way to do it, then you've already normalized it. So that's how Jody can answer that door and think, well, there's nothing unusual going on in my house. I'm just trying to exercise some demons from the children and yeah. She's just guys, we've got an exorcism dark. going on here. We've got Airbnb guests and an exorcism. Could you come back later? You know. <laughs> right. No, my, she says, she says, um, she says, I'm that's that's the other moment. She says, I, you know, I've got Airbnb guests, and I'm sure you've scared them to death. Like somehow, you know, never mind the fact that she's gonna be put in handcuffs and taken to the police, you know, taken to jail. She's concerned about the fact that her guests were scared to death. So talk about focusing on the wrong set of values. Yeah. I agree, Emily, that that phrase has stuck with me too, dehumanizing. It's, it's, it's an important word to sort of recognize. It's an important thing to recognize because once that's happening, crime can also follow. And once that's happening as with something as simple as bullying or something as extreme as killing. It's important to see when the, it's a, sometimes a very slow process. It's important to notice. So, yeah, so let's the other, so we're going to be looking at, at the video of E that's her initial, that's her first initial E at the time was, was about to turn 10 as Jody pointed out. But before we do that, I want to I want to set the stage a little bit with some of the research on isolation. And so, in other words, what we're going to watch is E being found by the police and her state. Go ahead. Right, right. But i i want to I want to frame that a little bit with some research and some thoughts about putting human beings in isolation and the impact that has on people. And in this case, obviously, it has on E and and R. R both R and E, by the way, were were both put in isolation. You don't, you don't. I think R's injuries kind of received a little more attention because they were so severe. But it's important to keep in mind that they were both locked away for hours on end and for months. By the way, this this happened for months. So. 
um, in case for those who don't remember the the um, charging document with the description of what occurred, I'm gonna I'm just gonna read this again to remind people of what happened to. They refer to to E as E F in the document, but. I'm just going to read this to for remind, to remind people what happened. So, uh, quote, EF was subjected to the same treatment as her brother. She was isolated and forced to do the physical tasks, remain outside, and denied food and water. She was also repeatedly told that she was evil and possessed, and punishments were necessary for her to be obedient and to repent. And these things were being done to her in order to help her. EF was convinced that she was evil and she needed to go through these things in order to repent. There were physical injuries to EF. So this, the last part of this talks about some of those injuries and how she was forced to run barefoot on dirt roads. But for our purposes tonight, I want to, to look at the video of E. When she, when the police find her, when they discover her, and it, when I saw that, so the the first time I actually saw that video, I didn't fully understand it, because the the police officer refers to E as a as a male, and the reason he he believes it's a male is because E's head is shaved, and it's confusing. So that was another thing, as as you and I know from our involvement on this case, that. That Jesse, who lived with Jody for many years, Jesse, Jesse's head was shaved by Jody as punishment. Jesse, too, I should point out, was Jody would take Jesse to work and Jody would lock her in her work closet for hours on end. So these these are not new behaviors, I don't think, for either Jody or Ruby. But just getting into this this issue of what happens to a human being when you lock someone, what happens when you lock someone in a closet for hours on end? Uh, there was so back in the late fifties, early sixties, there was a research psychologist. His name was Harry Harlow. He's most famous for his terry cloth monkey experiments. We've talked about him in some of our earlier podcasts. We have. What's what's less known about Harlow's research is that he conducted a number of experiments with rhesus monkeys and he put them in he put some of them in partial isolation and he put some in total isolation. And a lot of this research by the way was heavily criticized later rightly so. He was essentially torturing monkeys but uh fortunately now we have this thing called an RARB which stands for an institutional review board and Institutional review boards review all permissible research in advance so that these types of things don't happen anymore. But back then, that was still allowable. And so what Harry Harlow did was he he had monkeys and essentially had monkeys in cages. And some of them were in partial, partial isolation, meaning that they could, they could see each other. They couldn't interact or touch one another. And then total isolation was that they could not see, hear, or respond to any other monkeys that were around them. They had no contact whatsoever, and so they were totally isolated. They were not, however, subjected to sensory deprivation. So in other words, they they had light, they had food, they had water, they had a reasonably normal environment, all things considered. So in that sense, in a peculiar way, they had more amenities than the Frankie kids did, ironically. The difference, though, was that the that when Harlow conducted these experiments, he was taking the monkeys at a very early age and he was put the, putting them into isolation or partial isolation when they were younger. And he was doing that for three months at a time, six months, and then 12 months. He stopped, He was going to go with 24 months, but because the, the effects were so horrific at 12 months, 
he stopped. He didn't, he didn't go 24 months because that would have been fatal for almost all the monkeys. So actually, if you can pull up the, those pictures from the article, if you have that. So just scroll down to, I think it's page two. Thank you. Yeah, right there. So the, the picture on the left is the is part of the Harlow experiments. That is a picture of what he what Harlow called partial isolation. You can see that the monkeys can see each other. They're in their cages. They can't interact. They're restricted. Their movements are restricted, but they can still, there's some limited social engagement. The picture on the right is what he calls his, his total social isolation chamber. So there are different levels, but the, the basic idea there is that the monkeys have no social interactions whatsoever. So then if you, if you go down, if you go down a page, and thank I, I'm scrolling now. And thanks for explaining this too. For those that are listening on our podcast, they won't be able to see this, but we'll be able to hear you explain it. Um, just scroll down. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. And right. for those on our page right, right here. Yeah. And for those on our Patreon, we have this entire article already posted. We posted it tonight on our Patreon account, patreon.com slash into crime. So if you want to come see this full article um it's on patreon there you go so here here is the heartbreaking picture and by the way harlow has these pictures in his research article which is reasonably pretty unusual so the the reference here is the article is called total social total social isolation in monkeys and it's published in the proceedings of the national academy of sciences july 1965 it's volume 54. The This picture here is his total isolation chamber. You can see that in, this is what this monkey shown here is engaging in what he calls self-clutching behavior. So this is, this is one of the monkeys that was isolated for three months. And this is one of the most common behaviors that the monkey would, was, the monkeys were actually kind of trying to soothe themselves and, and, and clutching themselves. He called that self clutching. So the two most prevalent behaviors for monkeys that were isolated for three months were this self clutching type behavior. And then they were, they engaged in rocking behavior. Several of the monkeys refused to eat. So he isolated six monkeys for three months. One of the monkeys refused to eat and passed away. Another monkey refused to eat. So two of the six monkeys refused. To, well, they all refused to eat. Another monkey was, had to be force fed to survive. And all of the monkeys showed what he called emotional anorexia, meaning that they, they weren't emotionally responsive. They were emotionally numb. They engaged in these types of, of self-soothing behaviors and as I said, one of the monkeys passed away. It probably would have been two if, if the other one wasn't, you know, forced to, feed, to eat. So that was three months. By the way, the, this, this cage here where, where there's total social isolation, Harlow called that the pit of despair. So, um, you know, Harlow was, was an interesting guy. He instead of calling attachment, atta most scientists refer to behavior, you know, bonding behavior between her mother and a child as attachment. Harlow called this type of behavior love. So Harlow was a little bit of a renegade in the sense that he used terms that were somewhat controversial. And this is an example of that, to, to call this cage not a restricted cage or environment. He called it the pit of despair. So he, it suggests he knew exactly what he was doing here. He knew that he was inflicting harm on these animals and he, but he didn't, he didn't seem to, to mind too much because I think he believed he was doing this to 
further our knowledge of human beings and what happens during social isolation. So let's, let's move on to the monkeys that were isolated for six months. After six months of complete social isolation, the monkeys were I want not. To point out that there are some people saying, "Take these pictures down." If you okay. do not want to see these photos, do not look at them. We have given a trigger warning. This is heartbreaking. We're about to watch Eve, and these women did this to children. And so, if we're getting the point across, maybe we're doing the right thing. This is horrible what we're showing, and and so the trigger warning is there. We're about to see this happen to a child. So when people are demanding this or saying we're doing something wrong, we're actually making a solid point. So I just want to point that out. So bow out if you can't do this. And for those that do stick around, understand the importance of learning this and how it can hurt animals and human beings and how maybe these women deserve more in Utah and go write the parole board. Sorry. All right. Where do you want me to scroll, John? Right. There I'm not doing this to I'm not doing this to, to to create any problems. I'm doing this to make a point, which is that yeah, you can take down the I'm done with the article. You're done with the article. Okay. Yeah. There's a purpose in me talking about this, which is to show the impact of social isolation on human beings and monkeys. There's obviously not a huge amount of research out there on human beings because you can't do you 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 can't do this to monkeys anymore but you certainly could not have engaged in total isolation of human beings back then even back then so what we want what i want to show here is how dramatic the impact can be when you isolate either monkeys or human beings. And that's exactly what happened with E and R. And so that's why this is, this is important to understand. This is, I'm, I'm trying to facilitate a conversation about victim impact here and why it matters and why yeah. we should take it seriously and why the parole board should take this sentencing seriously. Yeah. And they should understand what, what what is really happening here just because e is locked in a room or in their if their perception is that e is locked in a room and that's it and there's no harm done then that's a misperception so that's so let's talk about the 6 months the monkeys that were isolated completely isolated for 6 months in that case there was no rehabilitation possible they engaged largely in complete social withdrawal and to quote Harlow, they had, quote, severe deficits in virtually every aspect of social behavior. After 12 months, the monkeys were, in Harlow's words, they became, they were, it, it was what he called social obliteration, meaning that they had complete social withdrawal. They didn't engage in play. They didn't show aggression, which was more common in the monkeys that were, that were isolated for a less amount of time. They had no social interactions and they generally were completely helpless. So, so the results are severe. When you isolate monkeys, this is what you get. You get, to, in Harlow's words, you get social obliteration. And it, it's not just, it doesn't last just for that period of time. It's, it's, the repercussions are enormous. It lasts well into the future, if not indefinitely for almost all these monkeys. So the monkeys at three months were able, three months who then reentered social interactions were able to recover more or less. Some of them weren't, as I pointed out, some of them passed away. So the impact was still severe. I should also mention that because this would be relevant to this particular case, the, the, the rhesus monkeys that were placed in partial isolation also had really serious ramifications and 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 trauma and some of the some of the symptoms that they exhibited were that they engaged in repetitive stereotypical movements which was quite similar to OCD type behaviors they were detached they were hostile and aggressive they engaged in self-harm 
which by the way, all the other monkeys engaged in self-harming behaviors, and they showed a general inability to form any adequate social attachments. Many of the, the monkeys that engaged in parcel isolation, they too refused to eat. So before we show the, the E video, the E closet video, I do want to mention the research on solitary confinement. So the only parallel we have with the Harlow experiments, and again, I, Harlow experiments would never happen today. Let me reiterate that. There's no review board that would approve it. So it was it was excessive, but it was it was research we have. So in that sense, it paves let's the way. From, what yeah. it paves. Let's it, learn from it both learned from it. Right. And then, so the closest thing we have today or since the Harlow experiments would be inmates that are held in solitary confinement. That's now referred to, by the way, as restricted housing. So, so the term solitary confinement is no longer widely used. It's called restrictive housing. And I think that actually is, is a, is a term that would apply here. We wouldn't necessarily see E and, and, and R as being placed in solitary confinement, although I could argue that. But certainly the term restricted housing would, would apply in the sense that they were, they were forcibly placed in confined spaces over which they had no control. And they had no autonomy and ability to, to move about that house. So... So in that sense, people have made analogies with POWs, with concentration camp survivors. Um, I don't, I don't think that that's unreasonable. So what, what does the research show on solitary confinement, where we're not talking about monkeys, we're talking about human beings? Well, what I'll let me go through some of this really quickly. The mortality rates for inmates both during and after incarceration go up dramatically, sometimes as much as 40 or 50, 50 times the normal inmate. Most prisoners, many prisoners held in solitary confinement have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. After, they're, after they leave incarceration, they are, they're more reclusive. They're more socially withdrawn. They engage in a huge amount of self-harming behavior, both during and after incarceration. After they're released, they show much more criminal recidivism. They engage in more acting out behavior and aggression. They show more of a tendency towards addiction. They show more depression. They show more anger. They show more anxiety. They show more paranoia. They Most of them have much more serious mental health issues. They engage in more obsessive thoughts than an inmate not held in solitary confinement or restricted housing. They... Also, and, and I didn't mention this, I should have mentioned this because this is critical. Many of the monkeys that were that were placed in total isolation showed symptoms of psychosis. Hmm. They lost wow. touch with reality. They didn't know where they were. They were disoriented. And that, by the way, is a is a is a symptom of inmates held in solitary confinement. The the odds of getting psychosis or psych, psychotic symptoms are <clears throat> are extremely high. So when you think about it, if you, if you, if you think about the elements of isolation with the monkeys and with prisoners held in solitary confinement, there's so much commonality. They're almost identical in many ways. That's not to say that <clears throat> there's an exact parallel with human beings. There's not. But the similarities are, are incredible and it's undeniable. And so, but, you know, the other interesting thing is that younger inmates, so in other words, adolescents that they've studied that have been in solitary confinement or restricted housing, they, they struggle more because their brains are developing hmm. and they have much less resilience to cope with forced isolation. They understand it less. They have less life experience 
and their brains, because their brains are so young and developing, um, they have a harder time with it. And that's another, by the way, that's another symptom of solitary confinement is that, that inmates whose brains have been studied after long periods in solitary confinement have shown decreased brain neuronal activity and decreased neuron co- connectivity. So in other words, there's less electrical activity in their brains and it, it results in the failure of more neurons and more neuron connectivity. So if that's true, by the way, of adults, I'm sure it's, it's almost certainly true of children. When it comes to E, uh, many people remember I did read the whole charging document and one thing I stopped on and and we discussed this multiple times before we ever saw this video was it took four hours to convince her to get medical help. And I'd always say what that was a shocking line for me. And I would always emphasize it in all of our previous videos. And now we see it. So I so having talked about this research on the Harlow monkeys and total social isolation and inmates held in solitary confinement. I think it's really important to keep in mind the impact of isolation of any kind, even partial isolation. And it's enormous. And just because we can't see it, that doesn't mean that there's not an immense psychological, emotional, and neurological toll. And I should mention too that a lot of the inmates that are that the numbers are tremendous. The, the number the inmates held in solitary confinement, their mortality rates go through the roof. Some of that is self harm. I can't use a term that you know because of YouTube. So, but some of that is self harming behavior. But they also have much higher rates of stroke, heart attacks, substance abuse deaths. The the mortality rate for these people goes up dramatically, like 50 to 100 times. So even though when, when we watch this video, even though you're not seeing anyone being hit, you're not seeing any violence or aggression or any harm directly. I think it, I, that's why I cited this research because I think it's really important to set the stage here with the impact of this type of behavior, or of this type of behavior that Jody and Ruby are engaging in. Yes. True. Play this. Yeah, let's, I just want to, uh, so I'll t- let's just mention that I'll probably play this for a while before we, we come back. This, play it. So th- roughly 3.30. Uh, I can play, I know, I know, but should I go ahead then? Should I? Yeah. I do know. Okay. And again, thank you to Law and Crime. This is a public video. Now it was evidence, but they do add their commentary in this, which we decided to leave in. And the description, uh, in the description of this video, we have a link to this video so you can find it. To as EF sitting inside of the closet, cross legged on the floor in complete silence. You come along, buddy. I am a police officer. Hey, you okay? Is it just you in here? I'm Sergeant Tobler. What's your name? I just have one. Where's your sister at? Contact one. You okay? Huh? You doing okay? You don't want to talk to me? So it's actually E, not a That's okay. I think it's okay. Sergeant Tobler would later tell ABC News they initially believed Frankie's daughter was a little boy due to the young girl having a buzz cut at the time. Tobler then tells EF they apprehended Jody Hildebrandt, but the little girl still sits silent, seemingly too afraid to speak. We got Jody out here. You know Jody? She's outside with us. You take your time, but I'm in no hurry. 
I'm a police officer. Did you know that? I don't mean to hurt you at all. You doing okay? Are you scared? Yeah. You're okay. Do you need help? You want to come with me? No. I'm not going to hurt you. Promise. See this right here? It's a badge. It tells me I don't hurt people. I'm just here to make sure you're okay. If you're in no way in any trouble. I'm not here to hurt you. I just want to make sure you're okay. And I get you if you're scared. I would be too. Okay. You want to come with me? Still visibly afraid, the officer then offers reassurance to the young child by sitting down on the floor with her. It's okay if I just sit here with you. We don't have to say anything if you don't want to. Okay. I'll just sit here with you. A little more than an hour later, EF is still afraid to leave the closet. Sergeant Tobler asks the young girl if she's hungry and would like some food. I'll put the screen on okay? when you're hungry. You can eat. There you go. Ooh. Thanks, EF. EF seems nervous to eat as she stares at the small personalized pizza for several minutes before slowly inching the food toward her so she can take a bite. Frankie's daughter reportedly eats the entire personal pizza and half of the large one. More than an hour goes by and EF is still afraid to leave the closet as officials take turns to try to get her up, but she's still not budging. One EMT tries to get her to talk, but she said she's nervous. You don't want to talk? Okay. There's nothing at all you want to talk about? It's okay to talk to me. Are you scared? So it's hard to watch. I'm going to I'm going to read This is I'm going back to the Harlow article on total social isolation. Um, I'm going to read his conclusion. This is on page 96. Harlow says, quote, the findings of the various total isolation and semi-isolation studies of the monkeys suggest that sufficiently severe and enduring early isolation reduces these animals to a social emotional level in which the primary social responsiveness is fear. Hmm. And so everybody looking at this agrees that she's afraid. 
Yeah. Some of it, of course, is she's she's probably afraid of some type of repercussions or retribution from Jody and Ruby. Right. That's a, probably a big part of this. But this victim has been isolated on and off for months and this type of environment with no food, no water, poor lighting, or almost near darkness. Fear. So fear in Harlow's experiment, fear is the main outcome, but it's fear that leads to social withdrawal. So it's the fear that drives everything else, the withdrawal, the deficits, the the self-clutching. It's the fear that leads to the self-soothing behavior. And you see that so clearly here. That, you know, it's, it's that I think that's what knowing the research on social isolation, I think that's, that's what makes it so difficult to watch this. Also when the officer is sitting with her, and the fa- she's mute, by the way. She's mute for almost three hours. She doesn't say a word for three hours. She doesn't move for over an hour. She doesn't move at all. And when the officer sits with her, if you pay close attention, you see that her breathing is rapid. You can see that she's so afraid. Yeah. And so an obvious question for me is what are the impacts? What's going to be the long-term impact of this type of trauma and this type of behavior, especially when you factor that in with this internalization that she's evil. She's getting the message from her mother and from Jody that she's evil and demonic and possessed and therefore in need of this type of behavior, that this, this is necessary. So I I think when you combine those elements, it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of time for her to heal. And and that's the, that's, that's the tragedy. Yeah. Right. Getting them in a safe space in, in a home that's loving is just, it's not, the conclusion there's a long long road and things that will now affect these children for the rest of their lives right the the fear the lack of trust probably the lack of feeling safe all that is going to take a long time i think to really change and for to trust people and to heal and to feel some sense of normality Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Where would you like to go now? I don't even know what to say to. Yeah. I I think it's tragic and. I think sometimes, you know, that. And people are probably, maybe people are wondering why, why we played that. I think a lot of true crime is about tragedy and often I feel like our community and our channel, we have such a great community, our, our gems. I, I, I sometimes tell you, or I make the analogy with that. It, it's like a Greek chorus and like a, in Greek tragedy, there's always the chorus. And the purpose of the chorus is to really, the chorus in Greek tragedy is a community. And the community observes and reflect on where they reflect upon what's going on and they reflect upon sort of this unthinkable behavior and they reflect upon all the pain and suffering that's occurring in front of them. And I, I think sometimes part of our job, I don't, maybe that's not the right word. Part of our commute, the goal, part of the tasks of our community is to bear witness to these types of tragedies. It's just to observe it and bear witness to it and acknowledge it. And even though it's unthinkable and often inconsolable, sometimes I think bearing witness to this kind of suffering just 
helps and it, it, it helps to make sense of it. It reminds us, yeah. it reminds us what we shouldn't do. It reminds us that the impact of cruelty on other human beings. And so I, I, I think sometimes I think of our community as sort of like the chorus in Greek tragedy. And it can get us to act and it can get us to be better. I think, you know, and I say that, you know, we say that at Hidden True Crime too, that, you know, when we talk about crime, it also teaches us about the world and ourselves. I think that maybe we can become better people too when we understand the effects on other people. Thank you. Yeah, I yeah. agree. The part we of... Do... Go ahead. I don't know that we can eliminate these types of tragedies. I don't, we're probably not going to, we're not going to eliminate suffering and pain much, but we can bear witness to it and we, we can, can pay more attention. We can pay more. Maybe we can stop it next door to us or in our own homes. Right. And we can, we can, whatever negative impulses we have in ourselves, we can recognize those and, and try to do better, try to express more compassion, maybe more connection yeah. to other people. More awareness. Yeah. More connection, even with phones. I think that it's going to be interesting what phones do to this future generation. Even as I raise my child, you know, working on my phone, just that lack of eye contact, little things. It matters. Connection uh, without an X matters. Um, we have to conclude soon. Is there anything else you'd like? I'd like to say a few things. What else would you like to say, John? Um, I think that's, that's, those are sort of my final thoughts for tonight. I did, I did have a, let me end with a quote from, so this is, this is a I book. I saw you by, reading this. Yeah. This is a book by Bruce Perry with Oprah Winfrey. So it's an interview. Bruce Perry is a, is a, a researcher and um, a doctor who's done a lot of work on trauma. He, he wrote this book with Oprah, what happened to you? He also wrote a really well-known book called the boy who was raised as a dog, which is an excellent book on the impact of trauma in case people are interested, but he's, He's talking about he's talking about one of his patients named James, and he's talking about trying to affect healing with James. This is from page one fifty nine of this particular book. <clears throat> Bruce Perry, Doctor Perry says, uh, "Quote: Relationships are the key to healing." But for James, every relational interaction resulted in disengagement. To him, others were not safe. In his world, the, the people hurt you or left you. Others could not be trusted. The lesson for me was that a key aspect of what happened to you is what didn't happen to you. What attention, nurturing touch, reassurance, basically what love didn't you get? I realize that neglect is as toxic as trauma. So uh, this, this paragraph here by, by Dr. Perry is, is amazing because it's, I think oftentimes we think of trauma as, as, as the title of the book suggests, we think of trauma as something that happens. We think of trauma as in some type of violence or accident or something physical. But, but Perry, Bruce Perry is saying, what didn't happen to you is just as important in, in affecting us in our future. And, and I think in showing and looking at this video of E, it's what's not happening that's as important or more important. It's, it's the lack of connection. It's the isolation. It's the lack, right? It's all the things she's not getting in that room. The lack of love that really, really will have an, you know, an enormous emotional impact, psychological and emotional impact on her and, and the future and all victims, by the way, too. So 
I just want to, you know, acknowledge that, that there's so many victims out there that go through this type of neglect, maybe not that specific kind, but versions of that where things didn't happen for them that has an enormous impact on them. And um, I just, I think it's important to acknowledge that and, and just um, recognize that, that relationships are so critical and any type of isolation and loneliness for that matter. Loneliness is a, can be a really horrendous type of isolation as well. But um, I just want to acknowledge that impact upon victims that's often not spoken of. And, and I think that was one of my goals tonight. Thank you. You met that goal. We appreciate you. Um, thank you, Troublemaker Baker, for posting our full playlist when it comes to this case. I see so many questions here that we have addressed in past videos. And so if anybody wants to listen to our entire playlist, um, I forgot to put that in the description. So thank you, Troublemaker Baker. And I will do that um, at the end of this live. Make sure to add that. Thank you to everybody uh, for being here tonight. And thank you to our incredible moderators. Uh, it's such a sensitive thing to have a news channel and true crime channel. And we appreciate um, everyone so much. Thank you so much, Marcella, as well. Thank you to everyone's support and the gifted memberships. I just want to share a little bit about what uh, we're going to be doing the next few weeks as Hidden True Crime is delving into the Chad Daybell trial. Again, I have our crash course available in the description of this video for the Chad Daybell case. If you are interested in this case, you will be interested in the Lori Vallow Chad Daybell case. And I say that as in it's important to be aware of them both. Because um, this shouldn't be happening again. And uh, if Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt showed something, it's that it's almost that this, this case of Lori Val and Chad Dable happened. Uh, a very similar case happened again in a similar area. So um, this case, this trial is important. And I would encourage everybody that has invested in the Ruby Frankie case to invest as well into the Chad Daybell trial, which is about to begin. So your crash course is in the description of this video. We will be live streaming the trial here at Hidden True Crime. Jury selection starts Monday, which will not be live streamed, but I will be in court and I will be uh, doing lunch lives. Uh, our Hidden Gems here know what those are, as well as um, I think some member only lives, uh, channel lives uh, in the evening but, but we're figuring that out aren't we john um yeah. we hope that yeah. everyone who celebrates easter has a very happy easter sunday tomorrow i think we are expecting the easter bunny to come in our house today um so uh, we've got to i think go die some eggs so we're taking off but um thank you to everyone for your kind say it was a heavy live in this community is just incredible um when it comes to these sensitive lives. And thank you, John. Um, so we will be seeing you guys in Boise, Idaho next time. Anything else, John? Oh, again, the Harlow research, the full uh, PDF uh, is in our Patreon account, patreon.com slash Hindu crime. And thank you to those who support us there as well. Anything else you'd like to say, John? Just happy Easter to all our gems and Thank you for being there with us, for us. We really appreciate everyone. And I know this was a, a tough topic, a, a difficult topic at times, um, but thank you for hanging in there. Yes, thank you. All right, everyone, have a wonderful uh, night and we'll be seeing you next week. Thanks and thanks for subscribing and liking this video. We'll see you.